It is believed that on the cold night of October 30th, 1952, in the quiet Midwestern town of Miller's Grove, the Holy Cross Church blew up at exactly 7.35 p.m. The explosion forced 15 of the town's citizens to deeply reflect upon the heretofore inconsequential details of their lives, for all had narrowly cheated death by arriving late for choir practice. Reverend Smithy had gone to light the furnace in the church that afternoon so that the choir members wouldn't be cold upon their arrival that night for practice. He then went home to dinner with his wife and son, but when they were about to leave, the baby soiled his overalls. The Reverend had to wait while Mrs. Smithy disposed of the nappy. Meanwhile, the twin girls on Maple Street were ready for practice, but their car would not start. They called their classmate Sadie for a ride, but she was preoccupied with the science project due the next day. Hank the Butcher was watching his two boys waiting for the babysitter who was running late. Despite her best efforts, Gertrude, the choir director, couldn't rouse her napping daughter, Beatrice, the choir's pianist. Dan and Anna, a newlywed couple, broke their habit of promptness that night because they were eager to hear the end of a 7 to 7.30 radio program. Dan's Uncle Frank was just plain lazy, staying in his house until the last possible minute. Firefighter Ted was in the middle of a different emergency call prior to the church explosion. At least eight separate unconnected reasons for none of these people to arrive on time at 7.30 p.m., and not a single one of them had yet arrived to meet their deaths five minutes thereafter. The odds of this fortuitous chain of events work out to be a one in a million chance. But the choir members spoke nothing of odds. They believed their lives were spared by divine intervention. Was it the same winking god that showed his hand nearly 50 years later in Africa? Where on a stormy evening on a soccer field in the Republic of Congo, lightning struck. Officially, the game ended in a 1-1 tie, but most people would say that the home team lost, seeing as all 11 members of the team were killed, while the football club from the visiting village walked off the field completely unharmed. Family members insisted that the only way this freakishly fatal event could have occurred was by practice of voodoo magic. An act of God, fate, lady luck, voodoo mind tricks, or simply coincidence. Mathematicians devote themselves to eliminating the taint of coincidence in our lives, calculating the odds of pure happenstance. These, the same mathematicians who will attest that if you had an infinite number of monkeys typing on an infinite number of typewriters, they would eventually type out the complete works of William Shakespeare. In fact, these experts would tell us that based on the law of large numbers, freakish events happen more often than you think, for there are 280 million people in America. That means 280 times a day, a one in a million shot can occur. Seeing as we often gauge impossible odds to that of getting struck by lightning, if an entire soccer team can be obliterated on any given day, how does that bode for our odds of survival? People's anxieties of what is possible have changed since 9-11. We feel less safe. We are encouraged to be more vigilant. And how can we not be when the signs are everywhere? Death. It's all around us. With eyes wide open, we can limit deadly risks by taking the right precautions. We try to be alert, informed, but are we truly at a greater risk of death than before? Or are we just more aware of danger around us? After all, air travel is the safest mode of transportation in the world, isn't it? personal or unusual the event, the more significance we give it, which is why we tend to react so strongly to incidents that revolve around near death or tragic experiences. We do not deal well with the idea of a random universe and our odds within it. 
so we comfort ourselves with reasons, patterns, conspiracies, anything to rationalize away the loss of control that coincidence brings. Of all the wonders that I have seen, it seems most strange that men should fear. Seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. What are the odds that one of our very own monkeys would so thoughtfully remind us that even Shakespeare's Julius Caesar recognized that certain events lie beyond human control? And if all actions are predestined, then really, no one should have to worry about dying. For even if there were no weapons, malfunctions, or lightning bolts in the world, death would still be after us. And to crouch in fear is to surrender any capacity for freedom that we may actually possess. <sighs> Feels good to be alive. Thank <laughs> you.